So if you grew up in the 90s and early 2000s, there's two characters that if I said your name, you'd be like, oh my gosh, I love them. Do you remember VeggieTales? Bob and Larry. I mean, what magical thing. We were talking about how Matt and I look like Bob and Larry, which is hurtful because I have red undertones. And I'm shaped like a tomato. So um, King George and the Ducky is one of their great stories that they told. And we're going to get into that in a minute. But one of the reasons I wanted to pull that up is because this past week at Foundry Church, we took the week and dedicated all our time and energy to adult VBS, basically to rewinding the clock, the biological clock in us and going back to our childhood and remembering that it's not just for kids that, uh, that we go and live the life of a learner, someone who's learning and growing in their faith. We actually had the opportunity all this past week. I would say we had a hoot. Yeah, yeah, I, th- I think it was a hoot. And um, we had a great time. It was missions focused. It was phenomenal. And for us as a church, I think the joy of it is we not only get to reconnect with some of the memories of the nostalgia of our own VBSs when we were little, but also remember that we're still learning. We're still in process. We're still being transformed. And um, that's one of the reasons I wanted to shout back to Bob and Larry, because uh, they did such a good job telling one of Scripture's most disturbing and complex stories. The story for them was called King George. George and the ducky. And, um, and I don't know if you watched it or remembered it, but it was actually the story, um, Respun for Children of David and Bathsheba. If you've not grown up in the church, this will catch you off guard because as we've talked about King David, he's a man after God's own heart. He has ascended the throne. He's a lowly shepherd, giant slayer, awesome man of God, just grows into the, the image of this, like, I don't know, just a great monarch. He's King David. And then the story of David and Bathsheba happens. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, what we see come to pass is this, that in the spring when kings go off to war, that's what it says in 2 Samuel 11, King David sent his armies out and he remained in Jerusalem. And one night late, and, and I'm, I'm telling the story, so I'm not quoting it word for word, but one night he's, he can't sleep. His armies are off at war. The palace is probably a little quieter, and um, he gets up, and he's walking along the rooftop. Now, it's very common in the Middle East that they would have rooftops where it's kind of like a patio, and he's up on his roof, and he's walking around, but he should have been at war. He should have been dead asleep in a war camp, in a tent, exhausted from a day of battle, but he's not tired. He's restless, well-fed, well-clothed, and clean. He's on his rooftop instead of at war, and he's walking around where he shouldn't be, and he looks down, and he sees Bathsheba, and Bathsheba is bathing. So there's this woman, and he sees her bathing in the moonlight, and apparently she was beautiful. And so he looks at her. And he stares, maybe just a little too long. And eventually the thought starts to swirl in his mind. Because if she lives close to the palace, she lives in a nice neighborhood, surely he knew who this woman belonged to. But still, he sends for her. His, his own desires get the best of his moral character. He sends for her. She, being a subject of the, of the king and a woman, comes to him. And he ends up um, treating her like his own wife. And it turns out, you know, about 28 days later, she's pregnant. And she lets David know this. Now, her husband was named Uriah, Uriah the Hittite. And Uriah had been faithful to David. He was one of David's mighty men who hid in the cliffs and the crags and the roads along the highways as King Saul hunted him. He was one of his faithful mighty men. And Uriah was at war. Well, David, now, I mean, David's in a pickle. Uriah's wife is pregnant and he is at the battlefront. So what does David do? He sends for Uriah. He gives him a shore pass and lets him come home. Uriah comes home and David says, hey man, eat, drink, be merry, go home, see that beautiful wife of yours. Eight months, you're gonna have a baby and you know, I'd like you to think it's a preemie. So he does that. Uriah, he comes out the next morning. Uriah is asleep on the doorstep, the threshold of the palace. And he said to David, how can I go? 
How can I go and enjoy being my wife's husband when I know the Lord's armies are out at war? How can I do that? So David's like, oh man, I needed you to be a little more biological about this, Uriah. But he doesn't. So what does he do? David gets him drunk. David gets him drunk and he does the same thing. He sleeps on the threshold of the, of the king's palace. So what does David do? David, with his own hand, writes a letter to Joab, the commander of the Lord's, uh, the commander of the king's armies out there fighting, I think it's the Ammonites, and he says to him, he, oh man, just get the darkness of this. He hands Uriah a letter, and in the letter, it is Uriah's death sentence. It says, take Uriah, put him at the front where the fighting is the fiercest, up against the wall, and when the fighting gets to its kind of fever pitch, pull back from him and let him fall. Uriah takes the letter, delivers it to Joab, and ends up dying. When all his plans failed, Uriah ends up being killed by the king he served. It's murder one. It's murder with intent, premeditated. It's as awful as it can be. And as you hear that story, you're kind of pulled in thinking like, not David, not this. This is so sad. But telling stories helps us understand what, um, what's going on. And one of the cool things God does is God comes to David and tells a story. It's actually the story of King George and the ducky. But the prophet Nathan comes to David after all the events and Uriah is dead and David has taken the grieving widow under his wing as his own wife. And the prophet Nathan comes to him and it says that um, in 2 Samuel chapter 12 that the prophet Nathan comes and it says that the Lord told him to go and talk to King David and to tell him this story. And the story was this. There were two men who lived in a certain town. The, both these men uh, kind of lived on different paradigms of it. One was very rich and had many cattle, which is a sign of wealth in the ancient Near East. That would have been great wealth. And he said one man had many cattle. He was very rich. Another man was very poor, and he only had one little lamb that he had bought. And he had raised it. And he had actually treated the, the lamb like one of his own children. The lamb ate from his plate, which I was like, don't eat lamb, eat grass, but that's not the story, right? It's his tenderness. He's telling a story that's painting a picture that draws you in that this lamb came and ate from his plate. It drank from his cup. It, Nathan said that he held that lamb in his arms like a daughter. And I have a daughter and two sons, and I will tell you this, there's a tenderness reserved for our daughters in the hearts of a dad. And so you've got this image of this closeness. Now, the wealthy man received a guest one day, and the guest comes to his house, and in order to be hospitable, the, the wealthy man has to kill one of his own animals and prepare a meal for his guest. But he doesn't want to kill one of his animals, so he goes and he takes the animal from the poor man. He takes it, slaughters it, prepares a feast, and feeds his guest. The prophet Nathan has told him this story, and it says this. David was furious. You can see him all red with anger, ready to go to war. And he says, as surely as the Lord lives, this man will repay four sheep for the one he stole. Who would do such a thing? He deserves to die. The words of Nathan probably rang in the ears of David in his, in his memory banks and conscience the rest of his life. Because Nathan turns and says, you are that man. You are the man. You are that man. It is you who did this. So what we see in this is David, um, David did something, well, he served himself instead of others. We, we see these three things. It's really kind of a three-note uh, kind of moment that plays out here. He served himself instead of others. David took the place of God on the throne of his heart. And we talked about that with Saul. Remember how Saul, Saul was on the throne of his heart, but David, David was a man after God's own heart. But in this moment, David took the place of God in his own heart. And he sat on the throne and let his desires rule over him. And then we also know that David took for himself what wasn't his and didn't obey God. David knew right from wrong. David was a good moral man up to this point, And he took what wasn't for him for himself rather than do the obedient thing. And we've all done this. It's the root of every sin throughout all history. How many times... Have we seen and despised people serving their own interests 
or serving others, kind of in quotation, serving others for their own interest. They, they've got a side angle on it, and they, they take from others rather than serving God. I mean, look at the way this happens and how it's the root of all sin. Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. Cain and Abel. Cain hated his brother because his brother pleased God, so he killed him. We can look at the people before the flood. Every inclination of the human heart was only evil all the time. When God cleaned the earth of humanity, Humanity. Joseph's brothers throwing him in the pit and hating him because he was loved and they were not. Um, their, his mother was loved and their mother was not. You can look at it with the Israelites in the desert where they got, you know, any time where God wasn't present among them or they didn't feel his presence, they would turn, grumble, complain, worship other gods. They were, they were completely um, fickle. The root of sin is us serving ourselves. The people in the time of Judges, my word, the book of Judges, that is just a garbage fire in there where you look at what's going on and you realize all these people were serving their own interests and then King Saul. How many times did Saul manipul manipulate, connive, and serve his own interests? And now David, even David, we lose the great monarch and it's so painful. And now even you, even me, even us. The lineage, the heredity of a sinful nature lives in us. And you are that man. You are that woman. So let me ask you this. Do you feel something pointing at you right now? When it says you are that man, you are that woman, are you like, whoa, whoa, hey, where, isn't church supposed to be happy? But maybe you feel this pointing, this sense of conviction, of burning inside of you that you're sitting there thinking, does, does he know? what I've done? Does he know my motivations and what's going on in my heart? That is conviction. When that burning inside of you gets restless and you know what you've done and who you are and you're like, oh, and you cannot live with it anymore, that's conviction. The Spirit of God out of love convicts us of sin, shines a light on it and tells us to either deal with it or choose that you will not serve God. It's really that black and white. We deal with the conviction of sin in our life or we walk away from God. David gives us a story and this story and this is an example for us of how to respond to conviction because David is laid bare before God and the prophet Nathan. And David begins to do a few things that I think can inform our response to the conviction that you and I are feeling in this moment. The first thing David does is confess. In 1 John, um, 1 John 1 verse 9, it talks, there's a word about confession, if we confess our sins. Actually, that word means, um, when you look at it, it means to speak the same. It means to agree with God on what your sin is. When we confess our sin, we are not getting it off our chest. Oh, it's good to have that off my chest. Yeah, that's not confession. That's not confession. That's some weird therapy that it doesn't work. What confession is, is to see the sin, to, to lament what it is in your life and what it's done to the Lord Jesus Christ, but also recognize that sin in your life, it has to be confessed. And to confess it is to say to God, I agree with you that that sin in my life is what separates me from you. And it's in me. I agree with you on what it is. We need to understand that word correctly and theologically. Confession is an agreement with God about your sin. It's not just acknowledging it. Yeah, I'm a sinner. That's not what it is. Yeah, I made a mistake. No, that's not confession. Confession is an acknowledgement that says, I'm a sinner according to you. And how you view it, I view it. It's a powerful thing. And what David does is he gives us a glimpse into his heart. One of... Um, David is known for so many things. One of the things David's known most for is Psalm 51. It is the confession and lament of a king caught in adultery and murder of a man he would have called his friend. He killed Uriah and took his wife. And David writes Psalm 51 as a confession to God and really I think to Israel because it's in the book of prayer and worship for the people of Israel. It says this in uh, Psalm 51, 1 to 17, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins, wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. 
Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say. And your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Sinful nature. Clear back in the Old Testament. Amazing. Um, uh, yes, from the moment in my mother, my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb. Teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep me looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my, my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence anymore. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I mean... That is confession. That is David saying, that's not dismissing that he broke Bathsheba's heart by killing her husband and murdered a good man. But he says, against you and you only have I sinned. My sin is a heart issue between you and I. I have sinned against God and it's hurt his creation and people whom you love. And when David does this, we look at it and we see a model of confession and recognizing that um, he's laying out before God time and time again, forgive me, purify me, make me clean. When you think of his crime, isn't it hard to be like, well, it takes more than that, but it doesn't. God forgives sinners. God delights in forgiving and restoring. Forgiveness matters. Here's what I want to do. Remember last week when Pastor Dan Seaborn was here? I mean, the dude threw fire at us. It was so very good. It was excellent. But what did he do? He talked to us about our identity. Our identity. Things said to us, things we own, and things we do. I think those were the three he had um, that Nowen had given us. But here's what Dan did in that, and I thought it was so good. He just reminded us we're God's children. We're God's children. He loves us. He delights in us. One of the things a good parent does is they forgive and they restore broken and wayward children. They forgive and restore. Your identity is not in who you were. Your identity is in who made you. Your identity is in who called you. Your identity is in who created you, called you, redeemed you, and has given you his Holy Spirit to work within you and transform you into the very image of Jesus Christ. So in order to have those things, we need to receive the forgiveness that is offered us. Satan, if we don't receive forgiveness, and it's so hard to just say, please forgive me, but look Look at what David did. He asked forgiveness. We have to ask forgiveness in this because in asking for forgiveness, we have to then receive the gift of it. Take it and open it up. You've already recognized you're a sinner. Now recognize the holiness, goodness, and wonder of God's mercy on you. Receive the gift of forgiveness. It's important that you agree with God about your sin and your forgiveness. Agree with him that what is under the blood of Christ is forgiven and redeemed, period. There's no way around it. So when we look at that and understand, we see that you are forgiven. You can accept that or you can refuse it. But if you refuse it, Satan will carpet bomb your life with memories of all you did wrong. And you will think he's right because you're not forgiven. You haven't received it. Satan will come through and sprinkle thoughts. Remember when you did that? Oh yeah, I'm a horrible person. No, you're not. You're forgiven. Doesn't mean there are consequences to that sin. But it does mean this, that sin is separated from you under the blood of Jesus Christ. Not forgiving yourself, it, well, yeah, let, let's do it that way. Not forgiving yourself is setting yourself up as a higher tribunal than God. Nikki from the Alpha Course quoted C.S. Lewis, the great theologian from Oxford University, and the quote we use in our profession of faith class. That is the quote. Not forgiving yourself is setting yourself up as a higher judge than God himself. You're saying to God, well, if you only knew what was in my heart, and he's like, Psst, I'm omniscient, I know it all. You're horrible, I know. I still love you, I forgive you. When we set ourselves up, we miss out on the thing that allows us to be brand new, to be washed new. Standing next to a bathtub doesn't get you clean. You gotta get in, get into forgiveness, receive it. Let it wash you clean and transform you. And then when you go to live your new life, cleaned up and ready, here's the thing that matters. The dig step, repentance. Repentance is an important word. And I love the football analogy in this because when you 
run uh, like this little kind of cut pattern where you either break to the out or the inside. Let's say you're running a, real, a little slant. You take four steps and as a receiver, you chop your feet a little, you stick your foot in the ground and you cut across, right? It's a dig step. Repentance is a dig step. It's, you're running your life, you feel the conviction of the spirit, you confess, you receive forgiveness and you stop the behavior. You put your foot in the ground and you follow Christ. You quit pretending and justifying your sins okay with God. Repentance is a verb. It is an action. It is a moment by moment movement that says, I'm not going to choose to live in the path of sin anymore. I'm going to put my foot in the ground and follow God in his mission and in his calling. But once we take that dig step, our life begins to change. Once we take that moment to turn in the other direction, our life takes on mission and purpose and value. We quit being identified by those other things and we start following Jesus and hearing his voice, understanding his word is living, active, and transformative for us. We begin to impact our community by living differently. People see the difference. The reality for you and I is this, repentance is a verb. It's something we do and we live in constant repentance. We're constantly choosing to turn and follow Christ because this world will lead us when, no, you follow Christ. You put your foot in the ground and you follow him. Why? Because then after that, you get to share the antidote. When you're living a life that has been convicted of sin, confessed, forgiven, you're living in repentance, you become a vocal, verbal, present bullhorn for the gospel. If you were dying of a disease and you knew the cure and you had the cure, but if you... Um, if you, let's say you had a disease and you received the cure and you knew it was miraculous and powerful and total for your being and you're like, oh my gosh, and you took it and you were just like, I can't believe I've been cured. This is so nice. And you walk away. While people around you were dying of the disease, you'd be a bad person because you should share the antidote, the cure to the disease. You have it. You have the antidote to sin. You have the one thing that removes the barrier between us and God. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. It's salvation in his name. As we said, this whole week celebrating an adult VBS and during profession of faith, new members, um, other people just growing in their faith and living um, at adult VBS in this way that says, I'm gonna challenge myself. I'm gonna grow in my faith. I'm gonna live a little differently. I'm gonna realize all that I'm called to and I'm also gonna realize all that I'm not called to. I'm gonna live differently. We must be ready to do something. Part of adult VBS in the missional identity of this week is singular, that we are called to go into this world and share the antidote. We are to be a living witness for Jesus Christ. We are to be a living witness in our words, deeds, and lifestyles. We are to be people who understand what it is to share the love of Christ in such a way that people who were once dead in their sins come to life in Jesus Christ. You are taking the antidote with you. If you live in conviction, confession, forgiveness, repentance, you now are being challenged, called, and empowered to share the antidote. One of the most beautiful parts of the scriptures is the way they live and the rhythm they give us in who we are in God, who we are in the heart of our heavenly father. And in Psalm 67, the writer of the psalm is compelled, like he has to share it, like a little kid who can't help saying something like, oh my gosh, I'm going to Disney World in two weeks. <laughs> and you're like, that doesn't make sense. But they can't help it. They just want to share it. They're so excited. This is what this psalm does. In Psalm 67, the psalmist shares the antidote. He shares this, this heart of God, this picture that matters so much. Catch these words. There's elements of it that uh, kind of ring in the rhythm of the, of the ironic blessing that we end with every week at the foundry. It's this beautiful, layered um, gift to us in the scriptures out of Psalm 67. It says this, may God be merciful and bless us. May his face smile with favor on us. May they, may your ways always be known throughout the earth. Your saving power among your people everywhere. May the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Let the whole world sing for joy because you govern the nations with justice and guide the people of the whole world. Isn't that wonderful? God's always had a heart for the nations. 
always had a heart for the nations. This is our generation and our moment to fill the nations with the good news. Jesus Christ, living, dying, rising, and redeeming. We are the mouthpiece of that truth. I encourage you, if you feel convicted of sin, respond to it and confess with God, agree with him. Repent, change your ways, feel the forgiveness and the joy and the blessedness of it, and then go live as people on a mission, a mission from God to change the world we live in. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we, your church, sit in a moment of hope and grace and opportunity, and I pray that you would give us courage beyond ourselves to know what it is you are calling us to, to know your good and pleasing and perfect will over us that you would speak to us a word of conviction. If there is sin haunting our lives that we don't want to deal with, I pray that you would corner it, God. Shine a light on it, convict us, and Lord, allow us the, the moment of choosing to obey you and confess it or to walk away from you. But may we not be lukewarm. May we not be carefree in this life and think that our sins don't matter. I pray that you would convict any of us here who are under a willful, unrepentant sin and that we would follow you, and that you would do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine according to the power that is at work in us through your Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and transform your church, your bride, who loves you and lifts a song even now to your praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.